Good evening. Welcome to the 2020 Candidates Forum. I'm Jean McFarland, the program moderator. This segment features the candidates running for state representative in the 90th Assembly District. The format will be as follows. The first part of the program will consist of questions asked of the candidates by members of the local media from the Record Journal. The second part will allow each candidate to make a closing statement. During the question and answer period of the program, each candidate will have two minutes to respond. The opposing candidate will be allowed one minute for rebuttal. To conclude the program, each candidate will have three minutes to make closing remarks. The toss of a coin has determined the order of questioning. Mr. Jinx will be first. Before beginning the questioning, I'd like to introduce the candidates running for state representative in the 90th Assembly District. They are Craig Fishbein, Republican, and Jim Jinx, Democrat. Mr. Gagnon, or Gagney, I'm sorry, will you please ask the first question of Mr. Jinx? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jinx, um, both you and your opponent, uh, Mr. Fishbein, are current members of your respective uh, town councils, you in Cheshire, um, Mr. Fishbein, you in Wallingford. And um, Mr. Fishbein, your opponent, uh, also serves currently as the incumbent uh, in the 90th district. And uh, while this is permissible under Connecticut state law, um, I was wondering if, um, would you consider uh, vacating your current position if it were the, uh, to be determined it might be a possible conflict of interest uh, in your statewide seat? Uh, what happened? Oh, a little bit. Did you not hear me? I think I, yeah, I think I heard the question. <laughs> oh, my apologies. Sorry about that. No, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, um, did you hear my question or did you need me to repeat that? I did. I did. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I think that I would uh, probably find it to be too much of a, you know, too much of a, of a schedule to have both positions. And I do think that it's, um, I mean, given the number of, of different things that I'm involved in already, um, but I also think that it probably is, you know, to some degree, a, uh, a conflict in, in some cases to, to have both of those, both of those roles. Um, you know, I do know that there has been some things that uh, that Craig has proposed at the Capitol that um, would sort of tie the hands to some degree of, of the of his of the town council um, in some ways. You know, one example um, being the um, you know to to make it so that a municipality can't regulate guns within their borders. Um, that to me is something that the, the town council should have uh, some ability to to deliberate on. You know, it's it's a, a local issue. So, um, you know, so I, I do think there are some some conflicts there, um, and uh, I, I would probably most likely uh, I would be vacating my position as town councilor once I'm elected. Okay, Mr. Fishbein. Thank you, Michael, for the question. Um, I, I disagree about the conflict. Um, we heard that 2016, we heard that in 2018. I haven't run into any conflict, actually, in, in Hartford. I, I think it's been a benefit. There's actually been times where I've been in Hartford and legislation has passed, and I've come back, I've had a council meeting within days, and I was able to report to the council, this just happened. The press didn't cover it. Um, a perfect example of that was a few years ago where uh, the budget was passed, and we received $2.4 million more than, how did a minute and a half go away that fast? Um, we put $2.5 million more than we originally budgeted for. And I was able to save the taxpayers here in Wallingford from having to expend those dollars by, by modifying our budget. Um, it wouldn't have happened unless I had the dual roles. And I disagree about the gun control thing, but hopefully we'll get back to that again. So, thank you. Ms. DeCores, would you please ask the next question of Mr. Fishbein? All right. Hi, Craig. Hi, Lauren. How are you? Fine, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you feel you're the best person to represent the town you don't live in? So can you talk about how you stay up to date on Cheshire issues? And Jim, can you talk about Wallingford? Sure. Um, even before I served in, in the state legislature, I, I was friends with 
many people in Cheshire that were in government. Um, Adam Grippo, David Velliber, uh, both of them are on the town council. Tom Rocco, who um, was the, um, in, in Cheshire they have district representation as well as um, at-large representation, different than Wallingford. Um, Tom Rocco had the same exact district in Cheshire that, um, that I serve presently. Tom and I would talk all the time. Um, about things going on in Wallingford, things going on in Cheshire. So it was a, it was a natural fold uh, coming in to represent that part of Cheshire. Also, prior to my being in the legislature, I had a very good relationship with Mary Fritz. And, um, you know, I remember when Bill, um, Will Fritz, who I went to school with, came to the microphone when I was running that first time and, and you know, gave me um, good words of praise because they know how close I worked with, with the family and um, learning about Cheshire, um, the farmers in Cheshire. Um, I spent a lot of time in Cheshire. Um, so I know a lot more about Wallingford, I will admit that. But um, you know, I, I do know a lot about Cheshire even before I served in the legislature and I continue to, uh, to know about Cheshire. So thank you for the question. Mr. Jinx. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really a, a, a non-issue. I mean, we, we both live in the 90th district. Um, I spend a lot of time in Wallingford as well. Um, my kids have done different activities here. I have lots of friends here. I do a lot of you know, shopping and eating here. Um, I love the town center here and uh, the trail and, and um, Tyler Mill and so on and so forth. So, um, I mean, I, I think we, you know, we both know the two towns. We live in the district. Um, but the, the role of a, of a state representative is to know the voters. It's to know uh, what's, what their needs are. Um, and that's the, the same whether you're in Wallingford or in Cheshire, really, from, from what I've been t you know, talking to voters over the last four or five months. It's the same concerns. You know, coronavirus, my kids are going back to school. How are we going to do that safely? Um, you know, that's, you know, so it's to know those issues and to know the people. Um, you know, no one has asked me, you know, what do, what do you know about Wallingford? You know, as, I, as, I've, as I've been in Wallingford, no one's questioning whether or not I know the town. So uh, I, just, I just see it as a non-issue, really, for both of us. So um, thank you. Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Jim Jinx? All right. All right. What should white elected officials do to ensure they're representing constituents of all races and ethnicities? Um, yeah, so it, it, it's going back to being a representative, going back to being uh, someone that's out in the community and talking to voters. Um, you know, you, you need to be out, um, you need to be out and be accessible and, and talking to, to people in the community. Um, you know, you need to also, I think as a, as, I think as a citizen in America now, you need to be kind of actively kind of working to be anti-racist um, and, and anti, you know, sort of prejudiced. Um, and that takes, that takes work. It takes, uh, you know, it takes, um, you know, studying. It takes, you know, kind of being around people that are not like you and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, so I think those are things that you, uh, that you need to, to do to, to just kind of understand and, and walk in other people's footsteps. And, um, but it's, you know, just, just, just being human, just being out there with people. Okay. okay. Um, Craig? Thank you. So... I guess rhetorically, because I guess I can't throw a question back, why does the question only ask about white representatives? I, because you're both I, white. Oh, well, okay. I think we only speak for all representatives, and, you know, equality is very important. And uh, I can tell you in the legislature, I usually strive for equality. I usually vote against things that set people apart. And you know, Martin Luther King said, separate is not equal. So when we treat people differently, we tell people that, that they need a leg up because they are of a certain race or even a certain gender. You're sort of inherently telling them by implication that you need the leg up. I've had people come to me and say, I don't want this stuff because it, it, it just perpetuates that feeling that I need it. You know, those programs that say that herald somebody because of their race, that they're you know, they've been able to build a business. I think everybody should have the opportunity to build a right. business. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Um, all right, Mike, would you please ask the next question of 
um, Mr. Fishbein. Mr. Fishbein, um, ridership on the CT Rail um, Hartford line is down 80% of what it was before COVID-19 pandemic, and home buying is rising rather than renting. So, um, what other plans do you have besides investing in transit-oriented development um, would you have for economic development in Wallingford? So uh, the first thing that has to be done here, and I've already talked to leadership about this, is looking at the schedule before you even get the economic development. You know, I, my wife and I wanted to go to the new Springfield Casino on a Friday night. We figured, take the train. Train left at 7.30 from Wallingford. You know, the last train that you can get back from Springfield is 11.30 at night. Doesn't make sense. Take the train to go to Hartford to go to work. First train is like 7.30. The next train is at like 9.15. Doesn't work. Until the train's schedule gets to something that people are going to actually use for their commuting, economic development will be restricted. Because if you build it, they will come. If I was going to use the train, if more people were going to use the train to commute for their work, then they would want to live closer. I mean, we have the Parker Place development that's here in Wallingford that's building very fast. It's, you know, people are living there. That's part of transit-oriented development, and as part of that, economic development will flow from that. But they've got to get the schedule in line so that more people use it. I've used the train, been going to Pennsylvania a bunch of times. Um, you know, those schedules are a little bit more wide out, but I've considered using the train to go to the capital, you know, to save on gas and that kind of stuff, but that schedule does not work for us. So, um, thank you for the question. Mr. Jinx? Can you just repeat the question real quick? Oh, sure. So, ridership on the Connecticut Rail Hartford line is down 80% of what it was before COVID-19 pandemic. And the second part of the question, home buying, um, is rising faster than renting. And um, so the question was, what other plans other than investing in transit-oriented development would you have to spur economic development in Wallingford? Um, well, I mean, the, um, obviously the, the, the train station's a huge opportunity, right? So, um, you know, and kind of weaving together the, the, the walkable town center we have with, with the train station area should be a, should be a, a goal. And there's, there's been some, some conversations in the community about it already. Um, you know, when you do that, it does spur, um, obviously it does, it's a launching pad for economic development, mixed use, you know, commercial, residential. Um, and and that's, that, that, will, uh, that will happen here in Wallingford as well, but we also need to kind of have a plan to do that. Um, you know, so I, I don't know if that kind of totally answers that, that question or not. It was sort of a, a two-part question, but, um, you know, that's not, it's, it's, it's a key to the next sort of 50 years of Wallingford is, is to kind of tying together the, those two areas of the center of town. Um, it'll lead to, uh, you know, more affordable housing. It'll lead to or more, more housing choice. It'll lead to more retail, coffee shops. Um, you know, so it's going to be more Thank of a, the kinds of things that people want in here in, in, in Wallingford. Thank you. Mike, would you please ask the next question of Jim Jinks? In light of uh, recent challenges to the Affordable Care Act and um, the potential loss of protections that it guarantees, such as uh, you know, that for pre-existing conditions, um, which now would include COVID-19, do you think it is time to discuss and consider a single-payer option uh, here in Connecticut? Um, so, I mean, I, first of all, I think that uh, first, healthcare, lowering the cost of healthcare is extremely important for everyone in the country, and especially here in Connecticut where we have other high costs. Um, so uh, it's a real drag in our economy uh, for families and for individuals to have to pay so much uh, into, their, into, into their healthcare. Um, over the last you know, decade or more, our health insurance companies have been working a lot on what's called cost and quality transparency. So they've worked on systems to show consumers or show uh, patients what something costs at a provider here, what something costs at a provider here, so you can make more of a consumer decision. Um, I think we should be focusing on developing more of that system for them, make it more available, more transparent for everyone. 
uh, because there's still a lot of uh, a lot of um, pricing and quality uh, that's, that's simply not transparent for, for the consumer. So you end up kind of going to who your doctor tells you to go to or going to who someone your friend told you to go to or you don't think so much about cost and, and also the quality. Um, I think we, you know, we need to drive down the cost of healthcare before we move to a more expanded access uh, of, of the system. Um, if we drive down the cost of healthcare being drugs, providers, uh, procedures, drive down those costs, then the step of, of expanding access gets a lot easier. Mr. Fishbein. Thank you. Um, I, so the answer to the question, and, and from my perspective, is no. Um, single payer option. Uh, but just to expand upon that, you know, I would go the direct opposite, actually. Um, you know, part of the problem is that we're not, it's competition over state lines. When you're able to open up the market to additional providers, then, you know, the free market says that costs will decrease. Um, you know, I, I hear my opponent talk about driving down the costs of health care. Um, you know, prescription drugs is, is one situation, but he also mentioned procedures. So now you're going to say to a doctor in the private sphere, you can only charge X number of dollars for your product. Well, that's socialization of our medical field. And what you'll have is people leaving the medical industry, and I'm over time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Craig Fishbein. All right, I have another health care question. Uh, Connecticut's abortion laws are viewed as among the most liberal in the country, but they are not locked in with the state's constitution. If Roe v. Wade was to be overturned, what should the state do regarding a woman's right to choose? <sighs> huh. Um... I don't know, it's a lengthy discussion to be had. I mean, we're not even, I mean, there's a lot of talk in Washington about, you know, Roe v. Wade and the Supreme Court and, and all of that. Um, I don't know that I even have a position on that. You know, I'm, I'm generally pro-life. I, I admit that. Um, you know, I, I recognize that a woman has rights. I also recognize that a child, an unborn child at some point is an unborn child. And how do you balance that? Uh, you know, is it, is it right? Um, and I don't know. I haven't wrapped my arms around whether or not it's okay for a state to adopt a policy like that where other states don't. But then we fall back upon states' rights, you know. We look at the Constitution. A state has the right to do that. I think it's a lengthy debate to have. Um, I've never been part of a major debate like that. And, I, you know, I, I like to debate. You know, just have a respectful conversation about, you know, the pros and cons. And, you know, if that ever happened, I'm not going to automatically close the door. But I, I'd like to have the discussions. And, you know, that's all I can say with all candor. Mr. Jinx. Yeah, I mean, if so, if it comes to the point where we're deciding at the state level um, on this issue, um, I mean, I would, as a representative, I would, I would want to, you know, hear from my constituents first and foremost. I want to hear from, uh, you know, from the people that it's going to impact first and foremost, um, and uh, you know, because they're uh, women are the ones that are going to be uh, kind of facing these these choices. Um, you know, personally, I, I, I would I would never be able to, to make the decision to um, you know my, my wife and I would never be able to make the decision to have have an abortion, uh, but I don't get to make that choice for for everyone else. So um, so I'm you know that's my position. I'm, I'm you know, for a woman's right to choose. Uh, Lauren, would you please ask the next question of 
Jim Jinks. Continuing with healthcare, um, Connecticut recently reached a 3% COVID positivity rate for the first time since June, and more than 200 people are now hospitalized with the virus. What plans would you support to mitigate a third wave of COVID infections? Um, yeah, so it was just, uh, I think, two weeks ago that we were in another forum and I was talking about how it was, uh, you know, we had, we had to try the third wave, we had to try the third phase opening because, you know, our, our, our uh, infection rate was still so low and all of a sudden two weeks later we're already at 3%, so things have changed quickly. Um, you know, we, the, the, thing that, the thing is that we're not getting, we're not getting through this until we, uh, we kind of make sure that the virus is contained. Nothing's getting back to normal until we do that, right? Um, so we're going to, you know, we follow the science. We follow what the uh, medical practitioners and what the uh, public health experts have been saying all along. We wear masks, you know, we wear, uh, we wash our hands, we avoid crowds, we uh, limit the, um, you know, our, our contact with people in close quarters. Um, you know, so we need to do all those things. Um, and the, you know, the, uh, by, all, by all accounts, the, um, the, the state and, and the citizens have done a good job of, you know, going from the peak we had in the spring to a, a relatively normal summer to being able to open schools. Um, I think we all did a good job of, of giving the kids and the teachers a chance to go back to school this fall. And, and knock on wood, we're, we're still there, and hopefully we can continue that. Um, you know, but I think we just need to continue to follow uh, our um, public health, you know, their, their guidance and um, and, uh, and just everyone just be safe and stay safe. Mr. Fishbein. Well, thank you. Um, well, I think one of the things that I would very strongly promote is that we get bra back the branch of government that I was elected to. Um, it's an interesting question to ask somebody who wants to continue in the legislature, but the governor has shut us out from those discussions. All of these decisions have been made by executive order. One of the things that the governor recently did was he allowed, and I support, more local control over these issues. You know, the municipality or health department can ratchet back from phase three to phase two. You know, the kids going back to school is an issue. There was an article in the Hartford Current just the other day, 5,000 children have not signed on to the online system. What's going to happen to those kids a decade from now? You know, those are things that, that really should be debated in the legislature and decided in, co in cooperation with the executive branch. But, um, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Mike, would you please ask the next question of Craig Fishbein? And Mike, can you just pull the microphone closer because I'm having a lot of difficulty hearing you. Oh, sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, who am I asking question of? My apologies. It's a fish. Craig. All right. Um, the State Department of Labor issued a stop work order earlier this year against a Wallingford massage business that was listed on a website featuring user-generated reviews of uh, sexual services. Uh, the incident exposed the absence of specific state or local regulations over massage businesses and what police say are the limitations of local law, enfo law enforcement to conduct extensive undercover investigations. What should be done at the state level to curb human trafficking and prostitution in Connecticut? Well, I'll tell you, first of all, on, on the town council, we, we took up the uh, local ordinance, uh, whether or not we needed to strengthen our local ordinance, and, and we decided not to, that the ordinance was already in place and we didn't have to make a modification. Um, on a state basis, I, you know, I think looking at towns that currently have local ordinances and, and what they've done that's been successful in these areas, and you know perhaps codifying that on a, on a state basis I, I, you know human trafficking not a lot of people realize you know they think it's just on tv but it happens in your own backyard and it's it's very unfortunate and it's very tragic and we should do whatever we can to um to try and prevent it um i can't tell you how many people i've talked to at the capitol um you know some of whom have been survivors of human trafficking and it's um very troubling. Something I really didn't even know about before I got to Hartford. Uh, that that it, you know, you think it goes on in you know foreign nations and that kind of stuff, but um, it's unfortunate. You know, there was just an incident on the Berlin Turnpike, I think, where they um, somebody was arrested, and it was part of that whole 
insidious portion of our society. Um, you know, as far as specifics, I have no specifics, but I think some municipalities like Wallingford have done some good things in these areas, and the state should be looking to that, to uh, for that pattern, and to adopt those things on a statutory basis. Thank you. Mr. Jinx? Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I echo some of what, what Craig mentioned. Um, you know, as, as, a, as a parent, obviously, uh, it's, it's, it's a terrifying prospect of, of, you know, of your child being abducted and then kind of losing them you know, forever through this kind of uh, human trafficking or something like that. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's just, it's heartbreaking. So, I mean, whatever we can do, I don't, I don't have any specifics, honestly, myself at the moment, but whatever can be done um, to, uh, to stop this from happening, uh, you know, I hope that we can pursue those measures. So, um, I certainly would be, uh, would be supportive of, of um, you know, of, of strengthening the laws and, uh, and trying to prevent this from happening wherever we can. Okay, Mike, would you please ask the next question of Jim Jinx? I just asked the previous question. Yes, because um, you asked Craig. We're going back and forth with you guys. Okay, okay. okay. Yes. Thanks. Okay, it's going to the economy now. Um, according to the Connecticut Department of Labor, the state has recouped about 60% of jobs lost in March and April during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, in mid-September, the state employment rate was still estimated at about 12 to 13 percent, and currently about 232,000 people are collecting unemployment benefits. Um, how would you, uh, in General Assembly, what would you propose to uh, first spur economic um, growth or recovery? Yeah. Jim. To me? Okay. Yeah, I mean, the economy is the, uh, to me, it's the major issue in the state, right? It's our, our stagnant economy is the most pressing issue that we face. Um, you know, there are a, a number of things I think we should do. I mean, first of all, let's have a strategy. Um, and, I, and I think our strategy in, in, in broad terms should be to focus on, uh, focus on three key areas that are kind of growing in our economy nationally that, that Connecticut's actually well positioned in, you know, aerospace engineering, uh, biomedical research, and information technology. Uh, those three things um, we could we could support more. Um, you can create kind of collaborative arrangements which uh, between the universities and those industries. Um, you uh, uh, you know so we can we can we can grow high paying quality jobs here in Connecticut with those those industries um, and and grow and, and build on what we already have here. Um, that's just you know one thing in terms of having a major kind of a, an actual strategy. Um, Infrastructure is another thing. Uh, you know, our, our ports and our highways and our bridges uh, need um, updating and improvements. Uh, we need significant investment in, um, in information, you know, in computing power. Um, that's been a major drag in our economy. Um, you know, all of these things we need to do to really get growth going in Connecticut. I mean, the, our, our economy has grown more slowly than, than virtually everywhere in the country. Um, and it has to do with, uh, with significant um, uh, declines in financial services jobs, declines in pharmaceutical jobs, uh, declines in public sector jobs, uh, you know, shrinking the government, um, and it has to do with not making investments in these other growth sectors. So um, I would, you know, number one, have a, have a strategy. Number two, focus on uh, investing in infrastructure. Mr. Fishbein. Thank you. So all of those things take time. Um, you know, what I heard my opponent talk about is retraining people, you know, expanding things. But we've got people that already have skills that are not working. Um, you know, that percent increase to, I mean, because on paper, I guess it's seven, around 7%. Seven but they're saying based upon the, uh, the um, that's just the people that are collecting, that they estimate. And I, and I put out the report the other day in social media. They estimate that the amount of people that... Um, that are not part of that number get you to the 12 to 13. You know, so, so the, we have to address this by getting those people back to the jobs that they had pre-COVID. So one of those things is when the governor said, you know, that locally you can shift your phases. 
you know, um, more local control, you know, what should be allowed now is a health department saying we can shift from three to four to say that there are no more restrictions. Right. And I'm done. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Um, Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Craig Fishbein? All right. Eversource was criticized for implementing a rate increase in July and then for prolonged power outages following Tropical Storm Isaias in August to the point where the legislature stepped in and created regulations around compensation for customers after long power outages. What more should be done to ensure the most vulnerable aren't taken advantage of by utilities companies? Well, I think the, the legislation that we recently passed that, that I supported is a step forward. Um, I don't think it was particularly strong enough. Uh, for instance, there's a, an appeals process um, that Eversource has that goes through Pura. So if somebody loses their food, let's say, um, and they put in a claim, um, Pura can, can appeal that. And the adjudicative body for that is Pura. Well, at the table, who represents that particular individual? Under the process that the legislature passed, they really don't have a representative. So, you know, that opens up problems, you know, and, and we're going to see how that, that works out. You know, maybe that needs to be tightened up. But, you know, the price increases that they were, that happened in July, I, I told the legislature that was going to happen. I stood up, I was on that committee, and I said, you know, when, when you say to a life-saving industry, which electricity is, we cannot operate without electricity, right, that... Over the, each year, you have to increase your clean energy exponentially so that we're almost at 100% in another 20 years. And then you tell them that you can only buy your energy from one supplier, it being Millstone, because that whole bid package was, was set up so that Millstone could only bid on it. The only one in our geographic area that could have done it is the one in New Hampshire, but because of the specifications... Millstone was the only one who could bid on it. You're creating a monopoly. When you create a monopoly, prices are going to go up. So I voted against all of that stuff. Um, and in July, when it happened, I said, I told you so. So people got to listen. And I know I'm out of time. Mr. Jinx. Yeah, could you restate the question, please? Sure. All right, so Eversource was criticized for implementing a rate increase in July and then for prolonged power outages following the tropical storm Isaias in August, to the point where the legislature had to step in and create regulations um, that say that customers can be compensated if the power is out for more than 96 hours. So what more should be done to ensure that the most vulnerable aren't taken advantage of um, by utilities companies? Um, well, I think, I mean, taking kind of a step back, I, I think that we need to... Um Eversource needs some competition. Um, we need to uh, have more, you know, and, and, and to have more resiliency across communities in the state, we need to have, I think, more local energy production, perhaps. And one thing that can be done uh, is to um, have what's called food waste to biogas production. So it's a relatively small uh, energy production plant where you convert uh, food waste that's collected locally into uh, goes through a process, becomes biogas, and burn for electricity. Um, and, and communities can do that and actually power homes uh, throughout the community. Um, so if we were to do that kind of thing, you're, you're creating um, a competition with Eversource uh, and other power companies. You're adding uh, capacity to the system. You're driving down uh, energy prices. Um, you know, so you're going to, uh, on a system-wide basis, you'll, you'll kind of protect the more, the more vulnerable uh, through more resiliency and through more um, yeah. and lower prices. Uh, Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Jim Jinx? All right. Question about climate change. Connecticut is experiencing a statewide drought after the blow of Tropical Storm Isaias, and um, it's a stark reminder of what is to come if climate change is not taken seriously. How would you address state economic needs without pulling the rug out from underneath future generations? 
Without pulling what out? Pulling the rug out. Oh. Um, so, so how would we address, how are we going to address climate change as a state, you're saying? That's, that's the question. As a more. state, balancing that with the economic needs. Yeah, I mean, actually, I mean, I just, as I just mentioned, the, um, uh, the, the, the need to become more locally resilient um, is one way. So more of a local, local production of energy, local production of food. Um, we could um, do, do more for small food producers, small farms, uh, in terms of the um, helping them to kind of, you know, uh, work through some of the sort of regulatory issues as far as uh, what, what keeps a small producer from, from being able to, to produce food locally and, and sell it locally. We could probably do something to help them out. Um, there are lots of, of, of you know, small actions we can take uh, as individuals as well uh, to kind of make, make you know, to, to, to have a smaller, smaller carbon footprint and to, uh, to make you know, our, our lives and our kind of system more efficient. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think we're, I don't think we are, um, I don't think anyone's uh, proposing that we uh, are, are pulling the rug out of anyone or any, uh, any you know, future generations um, by, you know, eliminating this or eliminating that. I think we need to begin to make changes, though, that uh, make everything more, uh, more efficient and more cost effective. And I mean, it's an enormous opportunity for our, for our economy. It's going to create uh, lots of jobs and, and a lot of more opportunities. So. Um, it's not a um, an elimination of something. It's a it's a, a transition from one thing to the other, and there's a lot of opportunity when that happens. Craig Fishman. Thank you. Um, so when I hear "do more for small farms" from politician, I think spend more money. Um, but you know, right here in our in our district, um, you know, a few miles from here, we have Jeremiah Farms. And I don't know if you've ever been there, but they've got huge greenhouses. Greenhouses need water, hot water, to make steam. And do you know that they, they burn uh, wood chips to create their heat in conjunction with the water? Um, that's how they get their fuel. And usually their chips are from places like when they cut down trees on the highway and stuff like that. You know, th that's something that we, we could in incentivize um, through some sort of a... a tax break or something like that. Um, you know, as far as the, the balance between climate change and, and the economy, just today I was at a demonstration of an electric school bus um, here that they're thinking of bringing to, to Wallingford. And I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike, would you please ask the next question of Craig Fishbein? Yes. Uh, this question regards the police accountability bill that um, passed through legislature this past summer. Uh, the most controversial provision of that bill um, included changes to uh, you know, qualified immunity, making it easier for those who believe they've been wronged by police to file lawsuits against officers, departments, and towns. Um, police and the bill's opponents in the legislature argued that change could lead to costly uh, litigation against officers and towns. Um, if you're reelected uh, to General Assembly, would you propose um, any changes to that law as it's currently written? Just that portion? Just that portion or any other portion than that? Um, I, I would propose changes to that portion, um, but there's other portions of that bill that I think are even more harmful that aren't, aren't as sexy. It's, you know, um, Section 41, for instance, has to do with a Police officer who's decertified in Connecticut cannot work as a security officer after that. But it specifically deals with a police officer who's decertified in Connecticut. If the public policy is to make it so that a, a bad police officer can't work as a security guard, why can one who's decertified in New York work as a security guard in Connecticut? It doesn't make sense. In fact, it's unconstitutional. It's a violation of the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the Constitution. You can't treat people different from different states. That's problematic. The other thing is, you know, we have faith, I have faith, in our police departments and our, um, our boards that approve their budgets. And there's provisions in there to get rid of um, uh, armaments that were acquired, and it isn't just armaments, it's boats, it's um, night vision goggles, those things that some municipalities use, they had to get rid of those. 
and stop getting those under this military program that allows uh, municipalities to buy things. You know, that's wrong. I mean, I think if we have faith in our police departments and something was acquired as approved by their local legislative body to make them surrender that and to stop using that program is bad. You know, we shouldn't get to the point that citizens or, you know, people that, domestic terrorists, are overpowered by our police. And um, there's a lot of problems with that bill, and I'm, I'm glad that I voted against it. Thank you. Mr. Jinks. Yeah, one minute is not nearly enough time to talk about this. Um, but, um, you know, Craig has mentioned several times, or he's made uh, reference to the fact that I'm in favor of, of not funding the police, and I have over the past year, and as a town councilor, voted twice to fund the police. One time, in fact, was to fund the purchase of new tactical vests for the Cheshire Wallingford uh, SWAT team. So um, to claim that I'm somehow not supportive of, of our police is simply wrong. I work closely with our, our police chief and the police department on uh, bike uh, initiatives in town, bike to school days, safe streets initiatives. And, um, uh, you know, and, and, and I've had conversations with our police chief about the, the police accountability bill. Um, I do have some concerns about use of force provisions. Uh, those are, are things that we need to specify better for police officers, and that's something that I think that uh, will be worked on in the next session, and uh, I would be eager to work on as, as a uh, legislator in Hartford. Mike, would you please ask the next question of Jim Jinks? Yes, hi. So what should white elect officials... I think we already did this question, right? What? Did we do the... In the previous 2019 um, session of the General Assembly discussed um, was a bill that would have regionalized school districts. Actually, it was a series of bills. And um, so uh, my question to you is uh, who should it be up to to make that decision? Should it be up to the state lawmakers or should it be up to uh, local uh, school district and municipal leaders uh, regarding the school regionalization? Jim, right. I'm sorry, Jim, That's it's your me. question, right. but did you, okay. did you catch it all? Did you? I think so. You're asking who should make the decision on, on whether or not we regionalize schools? Yes. Um, I, I don't think we should be regionalizing schools. I think we should regionalize economic development. Um, I mean, I don't think you're going to find a lot of savings in regionalizing schools. And I also think that, at least in Cheshire, and I'm sure here too, our, our neighborhood community schools are a big reason, our elementary level schools especially, are a big reason that people move to Cheshire and want to be in Cheshire. Um, they're a major supporter of property values and, and just the community. I mean, a school is a community. It's not just a school. It's not just a building. Um, so I'm not in favor of, of regionalizing schools necessarily. Um, there are uh, other things, like I said, regionalizing economic development in some ways that we, as a, as a, you know, let's say New Haven County towns or something were to share in, in economic development, that's a much better way to, um, to, to, share, uh, to share resources. Um, but the school issue, I think, is, you know, I, I'm not in favor of it. Mr. Fishbein. Thank you. So the question being whether or not the legislature should force regionalization or it should be optional to the municipalities. It should be optional to the municipalities. There are, you know, in Hartford, we make decisions that affect all municipalities. So we can't just look at Cheshire and Wallingford for everything. You know, um, Scotland and Chaplin, I believe, have two superintendents of schools. Their populations are a tenth of what Wallingford and Cheshire are. If Scotland and Chaplin get together and say, we would like to come together and be one school district, and save the cost of having two superintendents at $150,000 or something like that, that makes sense. But give them the option. Local control. But it should not be forced. No. Um, so, thank you. Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Craig Fishbein? All right. In an ongoing lawsuit, you and other state representatives are representing a group of parents 
that claim that face masks are ineffective in controlling the spread of COVID-19 and are dangerous to school children. Can you talk a little bit about your belief in science and what factors go into how you assess the veracity of scientific claims? Sure, I believe in science. In fact, um, just about two weeks ago, uh, there was a report, Great Barrington uh, is the publication, 2,600 uh, premier epidemiologists around the world have said that masks are ineffective with regard to COVID. Um, in that particular case, in the particular case that we have, um, we have disclosed experts. Our first round of experts were disqualified for certain legal reasons. Uh, we've disclosed new experts. Um, the state, their experts, they have gotten nobody that is willing to testify that masks are effective other than state employees, which is uh, a bit troubling. In that case, many of our clients have special needs children. And a lot of special needs students can't wear masks. And that case has to do about not just the effect of the masks, but constitutional rights that these children have. Not many people, we don't teach about the Connecticut Constitution in our schools, unfortunately, but a portion of our Constitution says that every, every person shall have a right, no, there shall be a free public education in the state. The case comes down to whether or not distance learning is equivalent to in-person learning. And when you say to a, a parent that their child can't go to school unless they wear a mask, whether or not that's a violation of their constitutional rights. So it's more than just about masks themselves. Um, you know, that's, there's a lot of moving pieces, but you know, there's about 200 parents in that case that have special needs children that are very concerned. Um, many of those parents have doctor's notes. They're not being recognized by the school districts. If you paid attention to the hearings we've had with the court, and I know I'm out of time, so thank you. Mr. Jinx. Yeah, I mean, to answer the question, yes, I believe in science. Um, uh, the, the mask issue is, <laughs> it's, a lot, it's about a lot more than masks. Um, obviously, if, if, if the kids weren't wearing masks in school, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have school. It wouldn't be open right now, which means uh, parents would be home with their kids, which means parents would be quitting their jobs which means uh, the economy would still be kind of ground to a halt. Um, the, uh, you know, the, it, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, the wearing of masks has enabled us to, to, start, to start to be back in school again and to limit the spread of COVID. Um, the, uh, you know, the number of cases uh, so far this year has been you know, surprisingly low. I mean, I personally thought that we'd be out of school by now uh, when we went back to school in early September. So. Um, it's, I mean, there's, there's just really very little question as to whether or not masks are effective in my mind. Lauren, would you please ask a question of Jim Jinx? All right. Um, thousands of state residents are going to be voting absentee ballot this year. Should the state move to implement mail-in voting statewide and retire in-person polling altogether? Um, I don't, I don't think we need to go that far. Um, I mean, certainly back, I voted absentee or voted by mail in the drop box back for the, the primary on a Sunday at four o'clock, which was great. <laughs> um, so that, that aspect of it is, is, uh, I mean, it's just so convenient, right? Um, but I also, uh, I'll be voting in person on November 3rd as well, um, you know, wearing a mask and, and trying to keep everybody safe. But um, I, I don't think we need to go to um, mail in 100%. Um, I do think we could do other things to improve voting, such as uh, perhaps moving it to a, a weekend day or making it a holiday or extending it to a couple of days. You know, there are other things we can do to make voting more accessible. Um, I, don't, I don't think that the mail in is the only option. Um, uh, you know, on the other hand, you know, we, we could be doing more of that too. So uh, the more people can vote, the better. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's obviously it's part of being a citizen, it's part of our democracy. Um, so, you know, standing in the way of voting doesn't make any sense to me. Um, there's absolutely no reason to be putting hurdles in front of people to, uh, to, 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 to you know, exercise their right to vote. So. 
Mr. Fishbein? So, um, I don't think we should be expanding mail-in voting until we get the infrastructure in place to have decent mail-in voting. I mean, we've already seen so many problems. Um, you know, right here in Wallingford, we had 216 or 61 ballots that evidently were wrong. Um, you know, that's troubling. So now what happens with those individuals who voted already, but now they're getting a mailing saying your ballot might have not been right, you know, is that legitimate, all of that stuff. Um, other states do. I think Montana does mail-in voting. They've done it for years. They really don't have problems from what I've seen. Yep. But they have the infrastructure. They, they've got a plan. Mm -hmm. So here we sort of did it the opposite way. Um, another state I saw the other day, there was like 30,000 ballots that are invalidated. Um, you know, obviously that's, I think it was Pennsylvania, that state doesn't have the infrastructure in place. So um, we should get it in place. Thank you. Okay. Mike, would you please ask the last question of the night to Craig Fishbein? Craig, what do you believe is our region's number one legislative priority that you seek to address in the upcoming legislative sessions should you be elected? Well, I, I don't see how anybody can answer that question without saying, you know, COVID. Um, you know, COVID, you know, I foretold that we were going to have the second wave. I don't know how you couldn't realize that. We saw what was going on in the South because people in the South were going indoors where it was air conditioned, so the numbers were starting to go up. In, in this state, you know, people are starting to come indoors. September, October, the numbers are starting to go up. It's the same thing. So, and this thing is going to follow us. Um, so, when this next legislative session starts, we're not going to. We're going to be at twelve to thirteen, maybe higher percent unemployment. We're going to have to deal with that in some way, shape, or form. Um, that's going to be paramount. There's really nothing else. Um, that well, there's a lot of other things, but that's got to be number one: getting our people back to work, getting our economic engine going again, um, making sure that our elderly are cared for and um, that we're going to come out of this okay. Um, you know, I'm still very concerned. Um, I remember when this all started, I, I, was, I, I said to my wife, this is the end of the human race. I, I was very scared. And um, I think the legislature is going to have to do a lot if the governor lets us do stuff, you know. We'll see, because right now his executive orders are through um, February 9th. The legislative session starts before that, and uh, or his, his declarations of public health emergency and uh, civil preparedness emergency are through February 9th, which overshadows the start of the next legislative session. Um, so hopefully the legislature will be able to weigh in on something, but that's number one on my menu. So thank you. Mr. Jinx? Yeah, just real quick, can I restart the question? Yes, if, if elected, uh, what would be your number one legislative priority in the upcoming session of the General Assembly? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, as Craig said, it's COVID. Uh, I do think, uh, going back to my answer earlier, I mean, the, um, we need to put a major focus into, uh, into, into you know, rebuilding the economy of Connecticut. So that has to be a major focus as well. Um, but uh, obviously, I mean, we we're, like I said earlier, we're not we're not gonna kind of get get going anywhere until we get through this this crisis, until we get through this pandemic. So, um, so COVID would be the the big issue for sure. Thank you. This concludes the question and answer portion of the program. Each candidate will now have three minutes to make a closing statement. Mr. Jinx, will you please begin? Sure. Thank you, Gene, and thank you to the, the Wallingford Wind Center for hosting this event. And um, thank you to uh, Craig for being here and for, the, um, for Lauren and for, for Mike for asking the questions. I appreciate uh, the invite. Um, you know, we are um, we're in the middle of kind of a three crisis, in my opinion. We have this, uh, the COVID crisis, we have an economic, you know, deep economic recession. Um, and then we also, to me, we have a kind of a long-running um, crisis in confidence in our government. And in our political leaders, um, and you know, I, I you know, I've, obviously, we're as I mentioned, we're we're not kind of kind of dealing with the 
with the economic crisis until we deal with COVID. But in terms of the, um, the sort of confidence in our government, um, you know, I think a leader can be someone that enables others to lead, that uh, kind of brings the community together, um, that's there to listen to all viewpoints, takes a broad view of things, uh, is looking for a good solution, not necessarily from the right or the left, not necessarily from one's own kind of narrow ideology or, or interests. Um, so I think, you know, a big part of, of being, uh, 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 of kind of healing this, this, I guess, this long-running crisis of confidence in, in politics and government I think isn't being more of a, of a of a leader that brings people together, and uh, and I I know and I have experience in doing that, and I know that I can do that um, at the, at the state level as well for Wallingford and Cheshire. Uh, I love these communities. I, I love the people in these towns, um, and uh, I want them to be the best they can be. And I think I'm the best person to uh, to do that for us. So um, again, thank you for the invite, and uh, it was it was a good conversation and good to be here. Thank you, Mr. Fishbein. Well, thank you. Um, it's always my favorite event of the year. Um, you know, it's been an honor serving the legislature. You know, many times I look around that room and I think about people that had served there before me, and I get chills. Um, quite an honor. Um, throughout my term in the legislature, I've stood for three things. Smaller government, lower taxes, and less interference in the day-to-day -day affairs of our law-abiding citizens. You know, my opponent mentioned before um, about a bill that I put in about local control of gun control, um, local gun control regulations. And that's the one divergence that I've had on, on local control. And what that has to do with is that when a state gives a license to someone to be able to possess a firearm, it's very difficult for one who has that license to travel around our state if different towns are making their own rules. I could see if it was a local license as we have with planning and zoning or inland wetlands or something like that. But it's very difficult when it's the other way and a state permit is, is given. And that's what that bill had to do with. And, you know, town council shouldn't be making those rules. My opponent also likes to denigrate what I do for a living. You know, I just want to tell you about one of my clients, Audrey. She was the first person who was fined by the travel ban. Single mother, just gotten divorced two days before she came back from Louisiana. Didn't know about the travel ban. And the Department of Public Health fined her $2,000. She had no income. And at the hearing, the investigator admitted they did her wrong. They shouldn't have fined her $2,000. That wouldn't have happened unless I represented that woman. Another example is Jennifer, who was recently beat up by her boyfriend. And my, my opponent talks about my comments on domestic violence that are totally taken out of context. Jennifer's boyfriend was arrested. She was given a protective order. Well, the next day, boyfriend went to court and claimed that she hit him. The court issued an order against her. He totally made it up. His claim of domestic violence was totally made up. I represented Jennifer. I didn't get paid to represent Jennifer. We went to court. I proved to the court that her boyfriend made it up. That's what I talked about in the legislature. And yet my opponent denigrates me for that. I hope you look at me my record, and vote for me on November 3rd. Thank you. God bless America. Thank you. This concludes the 90th Assembly District segment of the 2020 Candidates Forum. On behalf of the Wallingford Community Women, I thank you for watching and remind you to vote on November 3rd.